Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it's not even 24 hours since the Soyuz launch failure, and I'm on my second video about the subject, because the first video raised a few questions and had a few mistakes, and there's now new information out there. First of all, I want to talk about the Soyuz launch abort system. This is the escape system that brings the crew out, and there's two major components to this. There is the launch escape tower, and then there is the shroud which sits over the spacecraft. The Soyuz is made of three different parts. You've got the orbit module, the descent module where the crew sits, and then you've got the service module at the bottom. When the launch abort system fires on the ground, the first rockets that fire are in the tower, which pulls the shroud and the descent module and the orbit module off of the spacecraft. Then after that, there will be some the there will be boosters which fire on the shroud, which carry it even higher. And then after that, the spacecraft will fall out the bottom and allow it to deploy its parachute and everything. On the ground, you need to get high enough up that the parachutes have time to deploy. When the rocket is in flight, it has initially five sets of engines firing because, of course, this is a Soyuz. And again. Early on in the flight, you're going to need all that thrust to be able to pull the spacecraft away from a rocket which may be out of control and still have full thrust. But at basically about 1 minute and 54 seconds or thereabouts, that is when they jettison the launch tower. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this. I've looked at a lot of different articles and NASA's official timeline says that the launch tower ejects about 40 seconds after staging. Um, several other articles do this, but it looks like back in the early 80s when they created the Soyuz TM version, that is modified, which was for uh, the Mir space station, uh, they optimized their escape system. And they set it up so that they could actually ditch the tower early, they made it lighter, and this actually improved their payload because, of course, it meant that they could get rid of extra mass early. After the tower goes away, the shroud still has engines on it, so uh, those the shroud sticks around for another 40 seconds or so. The abort was called at one minute, or sorry, two minutes and three seconds, 123 seconds into flight, which was after the launch escape tower had gone away, but while the shroud was still there. The shroud would have used a set of engines called RDG motors, which is probably it's a Soviet acronym for a Russian acronym for something. And yeah, that would be enough to carry it away. It only needs the smaller motors in the shroud because after the four boosters have dropped off, it's just the core stage, which doesn't have nearly as much thrust. So that's what they use to escape. And it is worth noting that of the three launch aborts that have happened with people on board in the Soyuz, one happened on the ground and used the escape tower, one happened in space and it used just the power of the Soyuz, it didn't have any abort stuff, and this one occurred using the shroud for its propulsion. So yeah, we've had one example of everything. Another interesting thing about the Soyuz launch abort system is that when it activates, grid fins flip out and that will provide aerodynamic control during this early part of the flight. Okay, the next question that came up a lot was, why is there a 200 day lifespan on orbit for the Soyuz? And the reason for this is the peroxide fuel that it's used for its attitude control system on the descent module. It's not to do with uh, corrosive fuels damaging tanks. That does happen, but it takes longer. Uh, the peroxide is used uh, as attitude control. What you do is you pump this stuff over a heated catalyst and it will decompose into oxygen and water. But peroxide just sitting around in a tank will naturally slowly decompose to water and oxygen over time. So as it sits there in orbit, it is slowly losing the fuel that it needs to control its attitude. Now, the peroxide attitude control system was initially controlled uh, the entire spacecraft. But by this point, in modern Soyuz, it's just used for the descent module. The reason I think it's still used in the descent module is that there are people in there and obviously oxygen and water are fine if you inhale it. There was an Apollo spacecraft which coming down when it did a fuel dump of dinitrogen tetroxide and aerosene 50, it was sucked back in through the uh, into the like air and the crew got a dose of it and were 
you know, out of commission for a while. So obviously peroxide is slightly better from this point of view. Uh, the rest of the spacecraft will use uh, hypergolic fuels, you know, UDMH and uh, you know, nitrogen tetroxide. So, and that's what the main engines use. So that's what it uses for the rest of the system. But the descent module requires the peroxide for the landing. Now, that being said, hypothetically, if the Soyuz was run well past its sell-by date, uh, it could still perform a fully ballistic re-entry, which has happened by accident. Now, again, I've mentioned that before, the, the ballistic re-entry is where the spacecraft is just going straight through the atmosphere with no attitude control. That means that it goes straight down, it's gravity and drag is the only thing that's affecting it. A regular re-entry is aerodynamic. They adjust the angle of the spacecraft so that the aerodynamic properties of the capsule will actually lift it up and keep it out higher up in the atmosphere so that the g-forces build up more slowly and uh, that will actually allow them more time to bleed off speeds so therefore they can make uh, the astronauts you know the astronauts suffer less forces also being able to fly it means you can keep it within your re-entry area more accurately accurately a ballistic re-entry not so much the case so yeah 215 days because of peroxide fuel decomposition. Finally, I want to talk about some clues that have come out regarding the stage separation. And I'm going to need some props here to describe the Soyuz rocket, which is going to be this fine bottle of ground control that was very tasty. And we're going to imagine that this is one of the external strap-on boosters. Now, Korolev yeah, in the 50s, you know, he designed these things to come off, right? Now, in Kerbal Space Program, we would have like a single decoupler here and it would generate some force so the thing would go sideways. But of course, in the real world isn't quite as simple. Korolev's design was um, set up to provide, you know, to minimize the amount of pyrotechnics that we'd need. And having a big pyrotechnic that pushed that away, that would be complicated. It would put forces on the side of the tank. So his solution was that the uh, the strap-on boosters have like a ball joint at the front and it fits into a socket on the center booster. So the force is just run up. If you imagine my finger at the top there is this ball joint there. When the engines fire, it's pushing up like this. At the bottom, this is where the tethers are, where, this is where the struts are. These have the explosive bolts. So during normal launch, these things are providing all their force through this ball joint. When they are about to stage, what happens is they don't shut off the engines and the boosters. The engines keep running and then they trigger these explosive bolts. Now because the engines are still running, the force is now offset and these things will start to pitch outwards because of the force that's being applied. And as these start to rotate outwards, another system will kick in that will shut off the uh, engines here and open a valve up the top right here. There's a valve with a vent that point that basically vents the liquid oxygen in the pressurized tanks out this direction. And so that should, in theory, push the motor out and it will spin off like this. And you can see this in great videos. Now, one of the persistent theories as to what caused this failure was that this valve did not open. So instead of the valve opening and pushing the thing away, the thing just kept rotating outwards and the aerodynamics then caused the thing to smash into the side of the rocket, fall away, damage the side of the rocket, possibly destroy the attitude control, possibly cause a leak. The exact nature of the damage isn't important, but if that valve fails, that causes this booster to collide with the rocket. And that's the theory as to what happened. Now, I find this particular series of events to be convincing. It fits what we've seen. It fits what we know about the Soyuz. And uh, yeah, it could explain what happened. Now, of course, we're going to get more data. We'll see whether it stands up over time. But as of right now, I think it's time we'll continue. We will let the investigators do their thing. And we'll, of course, hope that the space station gets its stuff figured out and maybe uh, we'll have a Soyuz to launch before Christmas. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.